Oh my goodness, I think we've got it now. There we go. Nice. Okay. So here we are in our targeting software. Now I had a couple things that I really wanted to do first. Um, I just thought we probably ought to go look at the moon real quick. I mean, when the moon is up, don't you think we ought to Unparked. We ought to go look at it. I don't know what this will look like in our wide field telescope, but let's go take a look. Let's um Slewing to, to coordinates. And now let's go over here. So you can kind of track that. And then let's also let you look for a second at the um Slewing complete. Webcam. Let me find the webcam real quick, just so you can you can see. What we'll do is we'll um that's the webcam. It's rather dark, wouldn't you say? So there you can see that's a Rasa uh eight inch. And I just thought I would try using this laser. Can you see that laser? Yeah. Uh this is the dew shield up here at the top. See the dew shield, and there's the main optical tube assembly. Uh, here is the mount, it's a sky watcher mount, and then the dew uh, buster is down there. It's a, a heater element that runs this little band up here at the top to keep the dew from settling on the corrector plate. So uh, what we've done now is we've just supposedly slewed to the moon. So let's let's go. Um, Let's go find out. Uh, yeah, this says we're pointed to the moon. This is our um, uh, planetarium software. Let me adjust that size so you guys are seeing the full image of that. There we go. Oh, I like the, the ability to do that resolution a little better. And now let's go over to Sharp Cap. Yeah, that's the moon, all right. Let's go to about... Uh, Two milli <laughs> 200 milliseconds and see what our time should be on the moon. The other thing let's do is let's go out to auto. We did take the Botanov mask off, didn't we? Boy, that sure looks bright. Uh, 50 milliseconds. Look at that. It's just uh, 10 milliseconds. Incredibly bright. One millisecond. Okay, now we're starting to get in the range. What's below a millisecond? A 0.5 millisecond? <laughs> All right, let's go to 0 0.350 milliseconds. So this is a third of a millisecond. Now let's zoom in some on that moon. Go to about 50% and then go find that guy. See where we are in the frame. Here we are. So I think the part of the moon that's going to be more interesting for us to see is this part over here toward what they call the Terminator. And I don't think that has anything to do with uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. I think that's more to do with the place where the, see now like the sun is over here on the right. Let me make sure you guys are seeing that. Um uh, looking, no, you're not. Let's go over here. Yeah. Uh, look over here toward this. Now, I wonder if you're able to see. Wow, why are you still looking at the, um, I'm looking here at the live, I'm looking at the live stream. My live stream is definitely behind. Why is that? My live stream needs to catch up or something on my phone. Um, my live stream on my phone is still showing the focusing spikes, but that can't be right because in my in my copy of the live stream app. I 
your display Instagram is too stretched. That's why everything is so bright. Ah, good point. Uh, well, it looks like that you're seeing uh, sharp cap, so that's what's good. So let's let's do a reset here, and let's see if we can't make a little more sense out of this stretch here. I don't know, but what maybe. I've never imaged the moon before in this telescope, but we're getting closer, aren't we? Okay, so we're going to reset this. Thank you, Frank. And do an auto stretch and then go back down to point one, maybe. Gain is on zero. Point zero five, something like that. That's not a bad image, actually. Um, then I was thinking what might be nice is if we could go over here and zoom in on the moon, then what we can do is we can like try to figure out what part of the moon we're looking at here, first of all. Um, it looks like we are aligned roughly. Maybe we're off a little bit. Um, maybe the, but we're close enough to, I think, to, to be able to see a little bit. I was thinking if we could find where, like, everybody's, everybody remembers Apollo 11, for instance. And Apollo 11 landed in the Sea of Tranquility. So I thought, let's just find the Sea of Tranquility here. And I remember right, it's over here. Um, help us look here. There's Mar Humorum and Mar Nubium. Ah, here we go, Sea of Tranquility. So let's zoom in a little bit on that Sea of Tranquility. There's where Apollo 11 landed. So if you think about, let's remember where that image is. Let me see if you guys are looking at that. Yeah, you are. So you see where Apollo 11 landed. So let's think about, let's think about, um, this Theophilus crater. Uh, that's that's a recognizable tr crater. Isn't that Tycho? So we're going to go from Tycho on the other side of the moon to find this Theophilus, and then we're going to we're going to go off to the left of, of Theophilus to that sea. Okay, let's go back to our real image. Here's that Tycho, and let's zoom in a little more over to we went from Tycho up to here. So I'm thinking it's this sea right here. So if we could see Apollo 11, uh, if we could see the flag, it would be right. See, that might be that sea. So we might have to, we might have to go right here. we could see the flag, if we could just zoom in and get close enough to the flag. But aren't these craters here by the, um, wow, good to have you, Robert, from over in London. Nice to have you there. Uh, isn't this beautiful over here where the Terminator is? You can see the profile of those craters better. I think what we'll do is we'll drop back out to about here and we'll snap a picture of this. Um, just to remember that we went here. So that, that captured there. And then now let's go back to our targeting software and say for the moon, let's do an observation. And let's say we, um, <clears throat> we found, found Apollo 
11, that is the Sea of Tranquility. Uh, and I'm going to jot down what was our exposure. It was 0 0.05 milliseconds at zero gain. 0 0.05 milliseconds at zero gain. Wow, there's Christopher Lucas on from San Diego. Uh, oh, you're still in Sky Safari. Thanks for letting us know that, Frank. Uh, so this is not shifting over here automatically. I'll have to remember to change that every time I go. Uh, and then uh, what about when when I go to uh, the targeting software? Are you switching automatically that? No, you're not switching automatically that. So we, we 0.5 milliseconds at zero gain, the infamous Christopher Lucas, Penny says. And then the other thing we want to do is we want to grab that picture while we're here and copy it. So uh, to get to that, we're going to go to the desktop. And then what it does is it organizes it by date. So whoever your date is, that's going to be my wife. Uh, those are darks. What is today? February the 23rd? Huh. Ah, we should be. I need to change this view so we can actually see things. But I know what it's going to be. It's going to be this, the PNG file. No relationship to Procter & Gamble. Jeff Kelly, good to have you here from the Jersey Shore. Um, so that's alleged to be our moon, but that doesn't look very moonish, does it? I'm going to just go, while you guys are, are pausing there for a second, I'm going to go and just use a, a an Explorer window here and see what happened. February 23rd, capture. And I'm going to just blow that TNG up. Wow, that's a completely black frame. Very, very odd. So our snapshot did not save the moon the way we thought. So let's just consider that a um, an aberration with the moon. And let's go back uh, to our target list now. And let's do now a first real object. And I thought we probably should start every night with Andromeda Galaxy, shouldn't we? So let's slew to Andromeda. So. Slew to Slewing to coordinates. And that's the picture of the um, scope cam. Let's give you guys some kind of light out there. So you can see the scope actually moving. Peer east. Our focus is not there you go. So you can see the robotic-like scope is now trying to find Slowing the Andromeda complete. galaxy. And uh, now what we need to do at this point is switch you back to sharp cap. And I'm going to go over to sharp cap. Let's change it to auto. Let's do a reset here. And before we forget, let's go M31 here. And now let's mess with our, let's make it a 100 gain. And let's just start at maybe, um, I don't know, 10 seconds, something like that. And see if we can get something in our frame, like stars or something. Hmm, I wonder if we're winning, if Andromeda was in the woods or something. It, so we're not seeing very many stars there, are we? Let's uh, let's make that uh, 30 seconds, I guess. We could increase our gain, but that makes the picture noisier. Uh, while we're doing this, we'll explain that we're using uh, a program called SharpCap. It's kind of the standby for this type of astronomy we're doing, which is called EAA, Electronically Assisted Astronomy. And, wow, that's really dark, isn't it? Huh. 
do you think that maybe we're looking at the woods here? Ah, here we go. Let's do a reset here. And um, before we go very far, we're also going to do a um, plate solve. Now, I notice in this particular version that's just come out today, I, I upgraded. This is a release version, so I did upgrade. They've taken away uh, our brother Robert, I think his name is, or Robin, Robert. He's taken away our ability to plate solve and sync here. Now it looks like the only place to get the plate solve and sync is right here. So what it's doing now is it's comparing the stars that it's seeing in the image with the stars that it has in its database. And it's trying to find a match. And once it finds a match, it's going to try to say, uh, oh, you wanted to point at Andromeda Galaxy. You're just a little bit off. Let me adjust the focus a little bit for you so that you can be more centered. And it did succeed. Sinking to coordinates. And now it's sinking. Slewing it's to coordinates. Slewing complete. By 0.3 degrees, we were only off one third of a degree. So that's pretty good to go clear across the sky. So now uh, we've actually got too much gain there. Actually, let's decrease this to 20 seconds so we can see the image a little faster. And let's put this maybe back at 200. See how we do at that. 20 seconds at 200, you think? And then we'll start live stacking here. So what we do with live stacking, what this does is it starts trying to stack um, frames that it's saving. And look how it it's finding a lot of exposure there. So let's start and reset this reset this histogram and get an auto stretch there. Let's change this to logarithmic and reset that and then get an auto stretch here. Let's also see how it tells us over here to the left. Let me make sure you guys are seeing this. You are. Now when I move my mouse are you guys able to see my mouse move correctly? Because the last time when I would move my mouse, let me just check this. Uh, when I would move my mouse, it was it was in the wrong place. So I'm hoping that tonight. Anyway, you can see we've stacked for three frames here. Oh my goodness, look at our vignetting. That's not good. Um, let me do a color color reset here and another stretch here. Let's take this white level and this what we're trying to do is trying to start see ah here we go. Now we're going to bring this mid up and this dark up. What we're doing here is we're just in adjusting this histogram to try to see the Andromeda galaxy. Now that's with just five frames and 120 seconds. So this, this is incredible software to allow us to do that. Keep in mind that there's a 80% moon tonight. And we are in a sky in which we have um, uh, about Bortle 5, they call it. And that means very light polluted. But we are running a Celestron light pollution filter. And that helps us a bit. Now, we're still not getting our color, our color matching here. Let's start trying to do another histogram peaks. And then this black level, what we do is we set that kind of just right at the top of the peaks. And then we this white level, basically there's not, see how there's not very much white down here. So we can play with that a little bit. And then this mid, we just play with this so that we can see. I guess it depends on what we want to see. If we want to see, um, for instance, the middle of the galaxy, 
then we can bring this out and that'll uh, show us just this little hub that looks kind of like a fried egg in the middle. But if we want to see those uh, spiral arms, then we bring this out a little more. And I still think that's too much red, isn't it? Uh -huh. Boy, it's really touchy. The red is the primary color, I guess, that's acting out in those spiral arms. We've got 11 frames and three minutes. Now, just for the sake of, um, let me just start over here again, reset this. And then let's reset that again. There we go. This is looking a lot better. Now notice how we're we're not only seeing the Andromeda galaxy, but we're also seeing this companion galaxy here, M32. And then there's a, a dimmer galaxy here, M110. So we're actually getting three for the price of one. And just for a minute, let's zoom in a little bit more so you can see a little bit more of the detail and we can still see M32. Now, the interesting thing about M32 is that it is not so much of a spiral galaxy like our Milky Way. It is more of a kind of an oval, uh, almost like just an egg. It just looks like an egg. And we can zoom in on that all night long. In fact, let's just go up there for a second and take a closer look at that. Let's see if we can find that in our frame. Kind of, there we go. See, we can zoom in on this M32 and there's not a lot we can do with this. In fact, uh, you can, I just was, was reading about M32 today. I knew that we'd look at this tonight. And do you know that uh, what I learned today was that the most powerful telescopes, even in like where Chris has hiked up to the top of Mauna Kea or whatever it was in Hawaii, remember? And I think if I remember right, Chris, I think you took off your your shirt, even though there was snow on the ground, and you made a, uh, a an image like you were Arnold Schwarzenegger, or, or you know, I'm going to pump you up kind of thing or whatever. Even if you take that giant telescope on top of Mauna Kea, it still can't resolve much of this galaxy. There's just not a lot there to see. So that's unfortunately what we face with M32. But with M31, which is the Andromeda galaxy, we can. We can see a lot more. Let's go back out to maybe our wider field here. This is 16%. And let's... Um, Now adjust this peak one more time so we pick up a little more of the spiral arms. Now what you start to see here after all the stacking, let me get this out of the way so you can just appreciate the beauty of this thing. What we're looking at here, folks, is probably the... Um, when you look at this with your naked eye, and by the way, on a clear night when you're away from the city um, and you don't have much light pollution, so you're out in the country somewhere, you can see this um, hub here on a clear night. Just think about the fact that you are looking at light. The that's the farthest away object that you can look at with your naked eye in the whole sky. When you look at the Andromeda galaxy with your naked eye, you're seeing the most distant object. Now, look at what you're, think about what you're looking at here. You are looking through some clearances in the Milky Way, and this is allowing you to look in a completely different galaxy. And the light that left this galaxy actually left that galaxy so long ago that we measure it in years. 
And that number of years is 250 million, if I remember right. 250 million years ago, the light that left this galaxy, and you are seeing it firsthand along with companion galaxies here. And you know, galaxies do this, they travel in groups. 250 million, so you are seeing outside of the galaxy that we live in and looking at another galaxy. And in a way, this is a way to see a kind of a mirror image of the one that we live in. Because we can't really look at our galaxy in a mirror, uh, because why? Because we live in it. So we're, we actually live along one of these spiral arms, you know? Uh, by the way, look at this dust lane forming up here. Now that we have 27 frames, nine minutes of, of data, you can start to see these dust lanes. These, these are caused by like the soot that's in between the stars being thrown off and it's actually blocking the light in between some of the, the debris that's being spun off here. And it's being spun off in these spiral arms. Uh, this thing is spinning around and you're able to see it. When you look up in the night sky, you're able to see it with your naked eye. Tonight, we're able to see it with an 80% moon and in a city where there are a million people who live primarily because of what we call EAA, Electronically Assisted Astronomy. Uh, what that means is we have a very fast telescope. It's focal length, focal ratio 2, F2. So if you're a photographer, you know that you like using an F2 lens a lot more than an F5.6 lens. You know, we've got a very fast telescope and we've also got the ability to stack these frames one on top of another. And when we do that, it begins dropping out all the light pollution and lets us see only the stars and we're able to see the Andromeda galaxy. So it, it is a remarkable thing that we can do this. And what we do now is we save this exactly as we see it. I think you're right, Penny. It is mind boggling. Um, are you guys still looking at Sky Safari? Thank you for telling me that. I'm sorry, I, I had this set last week so that it would automatically follow me. And uh, unfortunately that follow is not working tonight, probably because these windows are new. And so I should go set that. But if I can remember, I'll just point you in the right direction. And Robert, if I forget, please remind me. Um, one last look, I saved this to a, to a picture before we, but one last look before we go, just take in the bigger picture here. This is M31, the Andromeda galaxy. And that's M32 right there. And then this is M110. Can't see very much of M110. Um, let's try to zoom in. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put it more like closer to the middle of the frame and then see how we do zooming into like 50%. Oh yeah, there we go. You're starting to see it does look like a spiral galaxy, doesn't it? M110 does. Or at least it looks oblong, doesn't it? Tell you what, let's go over to Sky Safari and uh, we'll cheat here. We'll search for M110 and center on it. But you saw the picture that they gave us is pretty much, I mean, now I'm going to put you back in Sky Safari. Remember what that picture looks like. And now look at it in uh, sharp cap live. And you can see you're on the way to getting that exact picture here. So even the largest telescopes, you know, would only see just an image like this. Um, you're just beginning to break it down as gaseous and maybe the stars are either in front of it or not. Let's do one more thing while we're on Andromeda. One last thing let's do. Let's go back to the Andromeda galaxy in our, uh, and let's play this audio tour and see if you can hear that. M31 is the great Andromeda galaxy. 
It is one of the easiest to spot and yet the most sublime object in the whole sky. M31 is the nearest great galaxy to our own Milky Way system. If we could travel to M31 and visit a habitable planet, we could see our own galaxy up in the nighttime sky just about as bright as M31. The galaxy was known as a nebulous spot long before telescopes were invented. In a clear sky, it is a naked eye object near the middle of the chain of three bright stars that form Andromeda. The Muslim scholar al-Sufi in about 900 AD mentions the little cloud in this part of the sky. M31 can be seen as an elongated ellipse with opera glasses that magnify three times. Simon Marius in 1611 is probably the first person to view M31 in a telescope. He compared it to the light of a candle shining through horn. This is still a good description of M31 in small scopes or on moonlit nights. In dark conditions and with 300 millimeter or larger scopes, two lanes of dusk may be seen accompanying the central portions. M31 is a spiral galaxy but turned at an angle to us. Its distance is about 3 million light years. Observers of M31 have declared that no telescope yet made is capable of revealing all the wonders of the Andromeda galaxy. Okay, so you heard it there, 3 million light years. So we don't really know. We, well, thank you very much, Robert, for that feedback. Uh, we want that to play at a good level. We don't really know what this galaxy is doing right now, unfortunately, because what we have here is a snapshot in time three million years ago. The light that we're looking at that's being picked up in the little cells of our Zwo ASI 2600 uh, MC Pro uh, astronomy specialty camera. It's a cooled, it's actually a cooled astronomy camera that's being cooled down to I think I have it set on eight degrees below zero Celsius. Uh, over here, we'll be able to see exactly. Yeah, eight degrees below zero, and you can see it's at minus 8.1 Celsius. It's a very special astronomy camera, and the light that's hitting the cells of that astronomy camera left this galaxy three million years ago. So we don't know what's happening in this galaxy right now. You know what I think? I think this galaxy is picking up other galaxies like M32. And it's it's causing galaxies like M32 to fall into M31. It's absorbing them, I think. And, and it's doing that in a very violent way sometimes. And this thing in the middle might be a black hole that's just absorbing them. This is a very, very astounding picture we're looking at. And I think we... We began here with M31 because it is an amazing sight. Uh, let's take one more picture because our live stacking has been uh, continuing while we talk. Oh, let's adjust our black over here a little bit. And then let's pull a little bit more dust. Look at that. Let's, let's, let's look at that now. See, you remember what he said about seeing two dust lanes? There you go. We're seeing two dust lanes now. We're seeing a lot better of, of uh, M110. And look how all of this dust is part of the whole, the whole thing that's going on there. And look at the way it's spewing out this material here. Wow, I've never, I've never seen that before. It's throwing out this dust here in another emanation. I wonder if we go here if we can see that no because the telescope they used had a narrow field of view you see I wonder if there's any this one's a little wider but it it's not showing that dust lane really as well as as for I don't want to brag too much on our camera but look at the way our camera is showing this dust coming out. Can you see it? And let's zoom in on a little bit more. Right here, you're looking at, look at these dark patches here. These are definite dark patches of dust and soot. And maybe, who knows, some of that might be dark material like dark nebula, but most likely it's the soot 
from this burning that's going on and the ashes and all the debris, the space dust. Now, it's not like the dust that's under your bed. It's not like dust mites kind of dust. It's it's dust like you see from a, a fiery explosion that's coming down from a volcano. And that dust is blocking parts of our view here from Andromeda. This is an explosive thing we're watching going on. This is violent here, you know, and you're witnessing it only, what did it say, two and a half million, three million light years after the fact. Um, now, keep in mind, just to put things in perspective, you're also seeing this in a moon polluted, 80% moon lit sky. I love how our 2600 has a lot more width to our image. Um, okay, let's pull ourselves away. It's tough because this is a beautiful view. Let's pull ourselves away from the Andromeda galaxy. And look at this. We have 56 subframes, 80, 18 minutes. And the astronomers' pictures of the Andromeda galaxy would be like five hours. Uh, and just through the amazing, uh, the amazing software and hardware of this combination of EAA, this is what we can get. And visually, if you would have had an eyepiece tonight, you would have been lucky to see this little white patch that is the yolk of the fried egg. It's only because of this live stacking phenomenon here that you're witnessing. You're seeing 20 minutes of frames stacked on top of each other and SharpCap is helping us out by aligning those perfectly with this aligned frame setting on. So let's, let's pull ourselves away here. Let's save an image exactly as we're seeing it. And so it's saving that view. Boy, I love the framing. We were able to get a lot of the galaxy. Next time we come, on another night, let's pull the galaxy a little bit lower in the frame and see what else we can find up here in this dust. But we're not going to do that tonight. We're going to go to another another target. So now let's go back to, now if I go back here, do you go back automatically? Rats, I don't think you do. I think I have to put you back there myself. All right, so what we'll do now is we'll say, Log an observation. I don't know why it says find synonyms. We're going to say here, for the first time, we not only saw the dust lanes, uh, we not only saw two dust lanes in the spiral arms, but in addition, we saw debris and dust being thrown out from the oblong end of the galaxy like uh, a volcanic volcanic uh, eruption. That's just amazing. Now I wonder if we go to our attachments here and say, grab that picture. I wonder if our picture will have been sorted out. Yeah, here we go, M31. And we want them, you know, what I'd like to do is change this view to extra large icons so we can see the pictures here. And you're not able to see this window anyway, are you? I don't think you can see this, but I bet you can see it once I place it in there, yeah. Now look how that saves. Let me just make sure you're seeing that. Yeah, look how that saves exactly what we saw in the, uh, this is a, a software called Astro Planner. And you know what? I just think it's the best for target planning and telescope control combined with uh, logging. I think it's the best with observing. We can put our image right here with the observation that we logged. And you can't do that in Sky Safari. Um, it, it doesn't let you put your own image with it. You can record an observation in Sky Safari, and and yet you're not able to attach that picture. So I really like that. I really like it for that reason. Also, during the week, 
I try to make decisions about what we're going to go look at, and I add things to this list. And it, it allows us to be able to kind of uh, see as we go. Uh, another thing I thought we ought to do tonight is look at some of the planets. Now, I know that we had in this list, you know what, I bet we've already missed it because we got so carried away. Look, Neptune has already set. And how do I know that? Because Astro Planner tells us it's at minus 17 degrees. So unfortunately, we're out of luck. I'm just going to delete Neptune from our list. I wonder how we did with Uranus. I, I bet Uranus is getting... Oh, good. Uranus is at 28 degrees. So now remember, no matter what earthly telescope you look at, um, you can only see it as a... Um, a blue-green dot. So we're not going to be able to. Uh, we're not going to be able to see like people on Uranus. Um, Slewing complete. So there we are. Our telescope pointed at Uranus. Now the other thing let's do is let's go to Sky Safari. I like. I like to help us. Um, I like to help us get a picture of where we are in the sky. So we were at Andromeda Galaxy. And just for orientation, by the way, um, look how low we were. I mean, we, we were we were just almost to the woods. There, there's a woods over on that side. And I bet we came close to missing seeing Andromeda Galaxy. But now let's go to Uranus, put my cursor up there, Uranus, and see, that's what we're going to see. We're just going to see a blue-green dot, and let's center that. Now, just so we can get an idea of where we are in the sky, let's kind of get oriented. This is the west horizon, and that's southwest. So you want to look between west and southwest, and more west than southwest. And then let's go up here till we see the zenith. The zenith is straight up. So if you just went outside tonight and you raised your arm straight up above you, like pointing at the very center of the tip top of the sky, that's the zenith. And you can see that we're about a third of the way up. You guys are seeing Sky Safari, aren't you? Yeah. We're about a third of the way up. And let's look at our info here real quick. Uh, it's probably not going to be in the visual magnitude of most city city folk uh, like I am here. It's, it's 5.8. And I bet you are, the limit we can see is like a maybe a four <laughs> or less uh, magnitude, maybe three, you know. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to use the telescope and and sharp cap to be able to zero in on this. Let's uh, first of all um, clear things out. We're looking at a dimmer part of the sky here. But look at that dot. You don't think that's Uranus right there? Would my mount be that accurate? Let's find out. Let's go to this little button here. It tries to plate, solve, and sync. So what it's doing is it's doing that thing where, oh, there's Lawrenceburg, Kentucky. John, good to have you aboard. I want to make sure you're in sharp cap. You're not. Oh, I'm so glad I checked. What we're doing here is we're syncing to coordinates. It just compared slewing, its database. Slewing complete. Yeah, it just compared its database. And that is, I bet that's Uranus right there. We're going to find out. So let's do another reset. Now let's change our target name, Uranus. Now let's go ahead and live stack. Uh, clear the live stack, and it's going to start stacking now. Let's do a reset and a quick auto stretch of that live stack. And while it's doing that, let's go 
play this audio tour so you can see her hear this again. Uranus was the first planet to be discovered and marked the beginning of the career of the great astronomer William Herschel. This remote world orbits the sun at 19 times the distance from the sun to our earth. Cold and remote Uranus was named for the ancient god who was the father of the gods. In a telescope, Uranus appears pale green, not blue, as shown in most photos. In a 63-centimeter reflector, it is a tiny ball with no markings visible. Sometimes, however, Uranus differs in brightness from its published value of about magnitude 5.7. It could be that clouds of the kind seen on neighboring Neptune by the Voyager spacecraft obscure and cause Uranus to fluctuate like a variable star. More work is needed to sort this out. Herschel discovered Uranus in 1781 while conducting a survey, the first, of the sky. He examined each star as it came into the field of his telescope and noted details such as position, color, and if the star was single or a double. In the spring of that year, he spotted Uranus high in the constellation Gemini. He noted that the star was absent from his sky map, and upon looking with differing powers, he saw the disk grow or shrink in proportion to the magnification. Stars will not do this since they are too far off to be magnified in size. Herschel thought he had found a comet and reported the discovery. When the orbit was derived, it turned out to be another planet, the first ever found. The poet Keats mentions this in the lines, Then I felt like some watcher of the skies when a new planet swims into his ken. Herschel became famous, and the new planet's discovery allowed him to set up a telescope building facility. At that time, he made the largest telescopes in the world. As for Uranus, modern observers and spacecraft show a cold and hostile world, a gas planet that is tipped over on its side relative to the flat plane of the solar system. Uranus also has a ring system like neighboring Saturn, but very faint. The system was reported by Herschel, but no later observer was skillful enough to see it, and its existence was written off as a mistake. Then, in the 1970s, it was rediscovered by a powerful telescope, lifted high above the clouds in an aircraft. It's a tribute to Herschel's skill that it took an aircraft-mounted telescope to approach his accuracy. Uranus has at least two dozen little moons. By tradition, they are named after the characters in the Shakespeare play The Tempest. Thus, we meet Prospero... Caliban, Ariel, and so on. All these small bodies are icy and desolate. Okay. Let's go back to Sharp Cap now and see what it's finding. Well, you see See that little dot off to the lower right of this disk? See that little dot there? That is one of Uranus's moons. And let's see if we can isolate that dot. And then we'll try to figure out what moon that is. Uranus has a real mixed up moon system. I mean, it is crazy. Um, the moons don't all rotate correctly. <laughs> Who am I to say correctly, right? The moons don't rotate in a, in a flat plane <laughs> is what I'm trying to say. They are completely bizarre. But what we're going to do is we're going to, now look how this Uranus is, is a disk. And now see how these other stars, they just stay a pinpoint. Now when we go back out to auto, see how Uranus looks like another star. It just looks like another pinpoint. But when we zoom in using our camera's power and the telescope's power, notice how Uranus becomes a disk and the stars don't. Now can you just try your best to look over here on this left side I'm going to go ahead and zoom in a little more, and we're going to lose some of our resolution. See how it's starting to pixelate a little bit, because we're going beyond the camera's capabilities. But look how over on the left, there's something jutting out there. That's one of the moons. And what we're going to do now is we're going to try to figure out if we can guess which moon that is. Very quickly, we won't spend a lot of time on this, but the way we're going to do this, we're going to look at star patterns first. Look how there's a two 
a two star pattern here and then a one there and look how there's a two star pattern here let's back off to 66 percent so it's two curving into two curving into uranus and on that side there's a moon sticking out so now let's go back to sky safari and let's zoom in on uranus and let's see if we can find the patterns that we're sort of seeing here. Yeah, see, look. See this two here and two there? And then it's pointing at Uranus. Now, how can I make this look like, what do I need to do? Um, remember what sharp cap looked like. Those, what if we, you know what we have to do? I think we have to turn this image upside down and invert it. So let's go here under, um, where is that? Observe, is that where this is? No, maybe it's under settings. Um, appearance and behavior, is that where it is? No. Hmm. Must not be under, must be under observe scope display. Um, field rotation. There's that. Wonder if that would help us. Could we rotate the field? Rotate this field. That's not rotating anything, is it? Maybe it only happens after we let go of it. Let's set it on 180 degrees. And see where our, oh, I didn't think that changed anything. That was scope display. Um, help me think of this. You know, we might have to actually use a help screen. Um, I don't think it's under this. Equipment, scope display, equipment, settings. Now, if you were going to be appearance and behavior, uh, I'm just going to go to the web real quick, get this settled once and for all. And I'm going to say Sky Safari how to rotate or how to invert image, how to flip the view. Um, this on the fly help. Go into the coordinate setting and use the flip vertically and flip horizontally switches. So it's under coordinates. So here I go back and I'm looking under coordinates. Okay, can somebody please remember this? Okay, so let's flip vertically and flip horizontally. Okay, so now, see how these are flowing up and to Uranus. Okay, now, that took us a little bit of a wild goose chase, didn't it? Let's get rid of our telescope display for a minute. And let's zoom in for a second. So now, let's go back to our view of Uranus. And I got to remember to send you guys back there. So I want to do that right here. See how now we're looking from the bottom. And so now I'm going to go back to, so in the direction, in the direction of one of these, 
Let's do this again real quick. Hmm. Boy, our red is just not wanting to balance, is it? Let's bring our You know why? Because the planet's blue-green, maybe. Who knows? Uh, let's go over here, and then let's take these mids, and let's find that moon again. Remember where that moon was? Oh, yeah, here we're seeing it. So remember the remember where this two is, and let's find the moon that's closest to it in the direction of the two. Okay, so going back to sharp to uh, going back to uh, sky safari. We're going to zoom in. Look at that. So I think this is the moon we're seeing in the direction of these two. I think, right? Because there's that two, there's that two, and now there's that moon beside Uranus. Let's go back and look at our, see if we're getting that right. Well, now I don't know. Look at that. There's something halfway in between the two. Oh, yeah, so it's that one that's close. Yeah, we're right. So let's look and see what moon this is. That's Titania. And then across from Titania is Umbriel. And then on top is Miranda. And on the bottom is Ariel. So Titania, you guys remember this, please. Titania, Umbriel, Miranda, Ariel. Okay, now let's go back to Sharp Cap. And I'm going to send you guys there so I don't forget you. So we can definitely see Titania. This is, what was the one on top? Umbriel. This one was Miranda, and then underneath, boy, Ariel is hard for us, isn't it? I wonder if we reduce our exposure a little bit down to like four seconds and pull this back a little. Does that help us see the moons better? Well, we're on our live stack now, so let's, let's restack this, bring our red back down a little. Reset that, get an auto stretch here, do our color again. Bring our red down a little bit. Bring up our blacks. That's a lot better, isn't it? Let's try to push our mosaic -y picture. No, that doesn't help us. So we picked up, um, for sure we can pick up Titania, and this one was Umbriel, but look how this just looks like a diffraction spike. It, it's so close to Uranus that it almost looks like a diffraction spike. And that one was called, um, remember what that one was called? Was it Miranda? And this one was Ariel. I don't see much of Ariel. It could be, it could be that diffraction spike, but let's... Let's say tonight we picked up three. Now, I don't think these are moons here. That was halfway between Uranus and the two, and then this other one on the other side is equidistant. So let's go back to Sky Safari. Let's broaden out a little bit and find our two. Yeah, so what is this? That's a star. It's a, it's a star that has one of those GAIA codes. It's a mile long. And then this is another star. So those are not moons. But we did see Titania. We saw for sure Ober. Oh, it's Oberon we were looking at. Titania and Oberon. But this just looked like a diffraction spike. I'm sorry. Umbriel looked like a diffraction spike. And we sort of imagined that we were able to see Ariel. Who knows? So let's remember all those names. We got... Titania, Oberon, and Umbriel, and Ariel. So whoever's watching there, we have 11 watching. Somebody remember these for me, please, because we're going to go record this observation in a second. Now, the other thing I want to do before we leave here, and unfortunately, I have to take the scope offline because it doesn't let us do this if the scope's connected. 
wait, let me first get anchored to Uranus again. Yeah. And I hope we'll be able to reconnect to the scope after this, but I just think you need to see this. Let's, by the way, this is the field of view of our telescope. That box is the field of view. Uh, let's go back out. So you remember where we are and then watch this. We're going to go to this info. Let me make sure you're seeing this okay. Yeah. We're going to go to this info and look how we can orbit. We can go out and see the orbit of Uranus. So what we're doing now is we're, we're actually going out to Uranus and zooming in on it. And look at all these rings. And that's part of why Uranus turns into a more of a glob, because these rings kind of gel in. And look at the way these, uh, all of these moons, it's just over the top how many moons Uranus has. But the other thing I want to draw your attention to, by the way, look, this is Titania. So that's the one we saw. This we saw was Oberon. We imagined that we could see Umbriel as a diffraction spike. And we thought we might be able to see uh, Ariel as a diffraction spike, but look at these other moons. I imagine if we were careful enough, we could pick some of these other moons out. We could do this. If we live stacked out here, we're not gonna do it, but if we live stacked out here in the sky, we could pick these other moons out. They wouldn't be moving, by the way. But just look at this mess. Uranus's moons are a disaster. It's a nutcase. Uh, the way all of its moons are not in the orbital plane of anything. It's just a basket case. Poor Uranus. I think probably that Uranus encountered something and got off track or something, you know, because it is just bizarre how messed up it got. If it thought that these were in any way aligned with this other, or here's another possibility, maybe asteroids or something came close enough to Uranus that it attracted these. And these were, what would you call that? Tidal, the tidal wave. They were attracted to Uranus. Uh, either way, Uranus is a mess, okay? And I think it helps us I don't know if I can do this now. How do I do this? Yeah. It helps us to zoom away from the, the sun and that's the earth. Let's do this. Let's get like this so we're pretty much along the plane of the major planets and let's widen back out again. There's the Milky Way. So now what you're doing is you're looking down at the Milky Way galaxy and you're seeing where is the Earth? Now, see how the Milky Way looks like the Andromeda Galaxy? Kind of, sort of, maybe. Look at the way the Andromeda is throwing off material just like the, look at the way the Milky Way is throwing off material like those, that dust that we saw from Andromeda. See, it's doing the very same thing, this, this whatever you want to call this, ash. Uh, Larry Fraley, so great to have you from Phoenix. Uh, Okay, so now we're zooming in on the Earth. Gradually, you can see how we come back to our own, our own solar system. And you can see that in the middle of our solar system is the sun. Let's zoom in on that a little bit so you can, wow, so you can see while we're here, so you can see the sun. I lost the sun. Here comes the sun. There it is. So there's, remember, this is Uranus still, and there's the sun. So 
Let's see, and then this is Jupiter. And then let's zoom in a little bit more. And there's Venus. And there's Earth. So this is what we're doing tonight. We're looking out here at Uranus, all the way across these orbits. I just think that's so cool. So let's now uh, go back to our regular, uh, you know, sky safari, our, our normal planetarium program. And now we're back on Earth, although it looks like we're kind of mixed up, doesn't it? Wow, how did we get so mixed up? It looks like we're upside. There we go. And, wow, we did not, what, before we, I tell you what I think we're going to do is, this is so mixed up, it makes me want to restart. Maybe when we recenter to the scope, let's see if we can recenter the scope. Please connect. Okay, it did. Okay, I still think we're kind of upside down. This is what happens when we do that orbit, but I thought, you know, it's worth it. Let's go back to our center. Yeah, we're upside down, aren't we? Oh boy. Hey, there's Montana. Jeff, good to have you. Uh, it's okay that you're late, Jeff. We record these and they'll be on YouTube if you want to go look at it. You know what? We're not going to worry about this, but this happened to me the other night. I got, I got upside down in Sky Safari and I don't know exactly how to fix this. because it really doesn't let you fix this very well. But you know what? I'm just not going to worry about it. But let's just go back to our to our targeting software now. And did we Oh wait, before we leave this. Let's uh, let me put you back in SharpCat for a second because you know what we have to do is we have to go back to our auto size. Remember, that's where we started with the blue dot. Let's zoom in one more time because we gained a little bit of ground with our, with our extra frames. It's really amazing that we can see moons of that planet, isn't it? Uh, look, we haven't lost a single frame, so our mount is being good to us. Let's save this now. Now, I wonder if we save with adjustments, does it save the zoom? I don't think it does. I don't think it does. Let's try it once, just for fun. Um, Okay, so we're done live stacking. And now let's go back to our Astro Planner, Robert Chandler, go back to the coordinates and uncheck. You flipped it. Ah, oh, you're right. Tommy, you're right. We're inverted because we're inverted. Tommy, you're a genius. Okay, so let's fix that real quick. <laughs> Since Tommy has helped us figure this out. Under settings, we need to get rid of these flips that are going on. <laughs> Tommy, Tommy, we owe you something. Thank you so much for solving this crazy problem. I could not fix this the other night for nothing. I couldn't figure out why am I upside down? Okay, now let's go back. Um, to see the astral planner to our to our targeting software and where were we? We were at Uranus. And let's log an observation. You can also do that here. And for some reason it always tries to search for synonyms and other catalogs. Let's say, oh my, we found do you guys remember the names of those moons? Help me. Was it Tiberius, Tiberon? That's the Tiburon. That's the word for shark. Tiburel? Question mark. I'll have to look those up. You guys, maybe you guys will put this in the comments. 
you'll have to remember. And then we also found Obriel, um, and uh, we saw ref refraction spy diffraction spikes that we pretended were, um, was it Miranda? And I forget the other. Oh, Doug, you should go look this up real quick. Info. No, we can just zoom. We saw Oberon and Titania. Oberon and Titania. Ariel, Miranda, and Umbriel. So we saw Oberon and Titania, plus we saw diffraction spikes that we pretended were Miranda. Miranda was on the right. See, so I can remember that because Miranda writes. Oh, thank you. Robert's helping me out. Titania, Oberon, Umbriel, and Ariel. Ha ha. Now this picture is going to be a waste because remember how much we zoomed in? I don't think these pictures show the zoomed in version. And I'm not going to take time to go crop them and zoom in on them. So I'm just going to show whatever we have here. Um, yeah, I was afraid of that. So we're just going to show 249 frames. We're going to show this. And I'll worry about cropping those later. Uh, that, that I, I can see it with my eyes. There's a dot right in the middle there, but you guys are not going to see that. It does serve as a reminder anyway. And then I'll zoom in and crop it later. All right, so that takes care of Andromeda Galaxy, Moon, and Uranus. Now, let's zoom through a bunch of objects. So what we do at this point, are you guys back at the targeting software? You're not rats. Um, what we do now is we resort the list in terms of what's visible and how high is it. And based on that, we pick our next objects. What's highest in the sky and what's visible? The moon we're done with. See, that's already observed. We did um, these on other occasions. Oh, Mars, what a shame. We, we, we got to go to Mars, don't we? Let's go to Mars real quick. All it is is a disk. You're not going to see a lot, but there's a there's a silly uh, rover on Mars that that we got to look at. Just kidding. Uh, slew to Mars. Slewing to coordinates. Let's go right over to Sharp Cap. Slewing complete. And there's Mars. I bet. Who knows? Did we stop the live stacking? Yes, we did. Let's uh, reset. Let's change the name to Mars. But we cannot spend much time here, gang. We have a lot of other places we want to go. Um, let's go back out to auto. That is Mars. Look at it right there in the middle. I don't see any sense in doing this thing, but let's do it just to get exactly centered. And it also helps our model. Every time we do this uh, plate solving and syncing, what we're doing is resyncing, remember, with the object. And that helps our model, which gives our mount a lot more data to plan its future slewing. Syncing to coordinates. Look at that. We were Slew only slewing off complete. three one hundredths of a degree. Thank you, Skywatcher. Uh, what is it called? EQ6, EQ3, 
6-R Pro. Thank you, Mount, for doing your work. I tell you, we've got to go say thanks to that Mount. We've got to because it is just doing such a good job for us. The Mount is that white part that holds the telescope. So it's right there. Are you seeing the, the laser? So right there is the mount, and it consists of the tripod and all this heavy, it weighs 45 pounds. Uh, got these counterbalance weights down here on the end. Uh, that mount is so precise that it put us within three one hundredths of Mars. That's how exact it was. So I had to go say thanks. Thank you, Skywatcher. Now we're back here. Um, we're going to do this real quick. And I don't see any sense in live stacking, but let's do it just because we can. Let's do this. And then we changed our target name. You always got to do that before the live stacking. Then we got to clear this stack out. And while um, Mars is coming into view there, let's just go really quickly and point out that this rover is called Perseverance that's on Mars right now. And this Perseverance rover is the size of a small SUV. So surely we can see it, right, on the surface? I don't think so. I'm just joking. We're trying to get our ducks in a row here. But they're not. What we're doing here is we're color balancing. And again, I wonder if it has trouble sometimes, not only because of the moon pollution, but also because of the, the sky pollution from the city. And then because the surface that we're looking at is so colored, it's finding extra oranges and reds in the picture. So it's trying to balance those, but we want that object to be orange and red. So I don't want to remove it, but... Now it's tricky to do these planets um, exposure-wise because the planets are so much brighter. Look how look how we're burning the planet so much so that it just turns into a big spike. You know, you see this halo and stuff. That's a sure sign that we have too much exposure going on. So let's bring our game back down to zero and set this on two seconds. On the whole, I really like how our um, camera is performing tonight. Over the weekend, you know, I really had, I had some problems with what we call our calibration frames. And the calibration frames are down here under uh, pre-processing. And I had done a poor job the first time shooting these, what they call darks. The dark calibration frames help the camera figure out how to subtract problems with your image that your camera is making, like, you know, hot pixels and stuff. The flats help the camera to calibrate and take responsibility for vignetting that might be occurring at the corners. And I can already tell our uh, calibration frames are working much, much better. But our calibration frames, we have to shoot the calibration frames of the exact exposures we're going to use. That's the problem. And so what I did over the weekend in my pre-processing homework here, I don't know if I click browse here, if you can see this. I bet you can't see that window, can you? Oh my goodness. What are you looking at? Yeah, you're looking still at Sky Safari, so you can't. Um, but that window shows me all of the different uh, flats and darks that I shot. It does no good for me to tell you this because you can't see that, can you? <laughs> but um, let me just quickly look. When I did those flats and darks, I shot 
Um, see, that was... Oh, I can't find them now. But in the catalog, I've just got certain exposures, and this is not one of them. So we're going to be outside our flats and darks here. But, but the reason we're doing that is because it's a planet, and I just didn't prepare for shooting planets. Let's back this down to one second and see how we do. Still too bright. it's not aligning these frames very well either. Do you think it's because we're losing our stars? And it, it's got to have uh, a bunch of stars to align on. That's okay. Let's don't pay any attention to that. Let's uh, make this 500 milliseconds and try to get rid of all that disk effect. Now let's reset this. Oh, we aren't live stacking. Well, I think it's because our our model is all messed up here. We lost our ability to. Yeah, it's ignoring frames because I've I've changed the exposure so much that it's losing out on the number of stars that we can see. Wow. Let's just stop live stacking and let's just view this real time. Now let's zoom in. Whoops. There we go. Now this is better. Um, now with a wide field telescope like the RASA, the telescope we're using is called a RASA. This is the best we can for planetary imaging. But you can see how it did change it to a disk. And if we experimented enough here, 0.4 milliseconds, I bet did we lose it? Huh. There it's back. If we experimented enough, I bet we could get just a little bit of surface, um, like maybe ice caps or something, if, if ice caps are visible. But our, our telescope is really a telescope that's designed for looking at the Andromeda galaxy. You know, We're not really designed, um, we're not really designed to do planetary imaging like this. Yeah, that's the best we're going to see. But you can tell it turned to a disk. And uh, that's the best we can do for Mars. But, you know, Mars doesn't do a lot. If we go over to our, um, if we go over to our planetary, planetarium program and look up Mars, um, Mars has been called the Little Earth, but the label is more imaginative than accurate. No other world in the solar system has given rise to more myth, fancy, speculation and awe than the little world just outside the orbit of our own planet. Mars. The name conjures up Martians, that cold, inhospitable race bent on invading Earth. Mars, the mysterious land of an advanced civilization that makes canals that crisscross vast red deserts, taking water from one mysterious center to another. Unfortunately, none of these fancies have proved to hold water. Mars is more like a bigger copy of our moon than a reduced Earth, yet these insights are the result of space-age technology. For the casual observer, none of the mystery of Mars has changed. In the telescope, it is seen as a small grape, looking golden rather than red, and is capped by a little patch of pure white. This is the polar ice cap. Vague, darker features are seen on the disk, which looks darker in the middle like views of the moon with the unaided eye. Features on Mars, unlike the outer planets or cloud-covered Venus, are really places on the firm ground. These places rotate, and the day on Mars is only a little longer than our own 24 hours.
Also, the features change in tune with the Martian seasons just as one might expect. Pole snows increase in winter and melt considerably in spring. Little wonder that people have thought of Mars as the home of another civilization. The height of Mars mania was in the 19th century, when observers believed they were seeing canals, cities, and strange markings that seemed to indicate intelligence. A wealthy French widow, Clara Guzman, offered a prize of a 100,000 francs to the person who devised a means of communicating with any astronomical body and receiving an answer. This led the astronomer Edward Bernard to pen a humorous story in which Earth scientists send a message to Mars asking, Why are you signaling us? Only to receive a reply saying, We are not sending you a message, we are talking to Saturn. From the decade of the 1960s onwards, spacecraft showed a Mars as not at all the home of space aliens. Mars has a very small atmosphere and a spacesuit would be required for getting around on Mars just as was used on the moonwalks. The surface is littered in craters, which are not large enough for viewing from Earth, but were never seen until the era of space travel. It is very cold, and although life weathers cold on Earth, Mars has been found to be without any life currently, and no firm evidence that life has ever existed long ago. Even without life, it is still fun to watch Mars as it loops about the zodiac signs. Mars takes a little more than two years to go around the sky, so it plays zigzag from sign to sign. It is good practice to follow Mars, and a challenge to keep up, since Mars can swing close to Earth and be brighter than Jupiter, or it can be as faint as the star Regulus. No other planet changes in brightness by this amount. In ancient times, the flare-up in brilliance was believed to be a sign Mars was on the warpath and calamity was sure to follow. Mars moves fast enough to be tracked in binoculars. Try it against the background of stars in only a few days or a week. Try it out for yourself. Okay, I just want to point out that the reason why these pictures are so nice, look at this credit. It's from the Hubble Space Telescope, for Pete's sake. <laughs> you know, Mars doesn't show up like this in our telescope, and I think you guys can uh, give that credit. But we did want to go look at Mars just simply because, um, uh, you know, it seemed fitting uh, with, uh, with this new uh, rover that's there. I would encourage you to go to the website, uh, mars.nasa.gov mars.nasa.gov I'll put that in mars.nasa.gov slash mars2020 yeah mars.nasa.gov slash mars2020 and there's where you can learn a lot more about the rover uh, firsthand from you know the JPL folks and uh, uh, the folks at NASA themselves. So uh, that's probably enough for Mars. We, we had to just stop by Mars because of the unique thing that's going on now with the, the rover. So let's uh, send you back over to the um, uh, Astro Planner and do a new observation and say... Um, Just a tiny disk, no surface detail that we could spot. And just because we can, I'll um, save a snapshot of that just because we can. You know, it's kind of like, you know what it's like? It's like if you go on vacation and you see some kind of landmark, and when you see it, you think, boy, I just, it just didn't look like it does in the pictures, did it, honey? And you still take your own picture of it, don't you? <laughs> because we were there, and we want to prove it. So right in the middle of that black area is a tiny disk. <laughs> we're going to pretend, and that's Mars. Uh, okay, we've got 10 minutes left. Let's make sure that we've done everything we wanted to do. Um, let's go down here to, are you at Astro Planner? Uh, yeah, you're at Astro Planner. Uh, let's sort the list again. 
And then let's just glance real quick. Uh, we did the moon. See, it shows us here two observations. We did the moon. What we can actually do, you know, it seems fitting that we go to the Great Nebula of Orion, doesn't it? Just because it's there. Um, Slewing to coordinates. Let's um, put you guys at... Slewing Shortcut. complete. And then, let's see, reset this, put in our new name, which is um, M42, right? Orion Nebula. And make sure we do that again. And let's do our plate solve just again. I'm going back up to that menu, but now it's down here in this new... This this is a version of SharpCap that was just literally released today. And I, I downloaded it at like literally 15 minutes till start time. <laughs> it was last things. So I'm, I'm still getting used to the fact that that plate solve and sync button is no longer a menu item. It's just a button. Sinking to coordinates. So four. Slewing, slewing complete. Four one hundredths of a degree accuracy. Thank you, Skywatcher. And we're gonna. We're not gonna reset that. We're gonna go up here and start live stacking and clear this stack. And let's uh, reset this. And also reset our color. We, we we can't really do much with color until we get some frames. Look at it ignoring those frames. Here I was just... It's because our exposure is not right. Uh, let's stop live stacking. And let's go back up here and say, let's give us something like 10 seconds at 200 gain to start with. We were set on Mars. Now let's... I'm surprised that we were able to sync, uh, plate solve and sync. Uh, so now let's do, see, we reset this, didn't we? Let's live stack again and clear this and start from scratch. And let's reset that and this. And then let's give it a little bit of, um, a little bit of a few frames just to catch before we try to work with our color sum. There we got two frames at 20 seconds. I mean, two frames at 10 seconds. So we got a total of 20 seconds of data. This is going to be pretty hot. This is a bright nebula. This is Orion Nebula. Man, I want to thank you guys for coming. Uh, there, there are eight of you out there right now. I think I've heard from some of you. It's Jeff and Frank. Thanks for coming. Robert, Tommy. Tommy, you were the one who saved me and helped me learn what I had been doing wrong on uh, Sky Safari. Uh, Jeff from Montana. Larry, so nice of you. A tsunami of moons. That's a very picturesque way to say it. John from Lawrenceburg, Kentucky. And of course, Penny, my wife. Um, Chris Chris logged in from San Diego, of all places. He's on the road again. On the road again. So thank you all for being here. Uh, we're in our last six minutes. Let's see what we can do. Let's change this to auto for a minute. And now let's do a new reset here and a new auto stretch and then a new color balance reset. And let's let's try to tune based on our our little uh, peaks. And then, you know, our white level is up here. It probably doesn't have to be quite that high, but let's just leave it for now. And then let's let's kind of play with our mids and start seeing what we're looking at here. This is a really good framing of the Orion Nebula, because look, we're not only getting the Orion Nebula, but we're picking up this, which isn't that called the Running Man Nebula here. Uh, so we're we're really well framed. And I, I got to say, this is just a courtesy of Astro Planner, uh, picked out this framing for us by telling us the exact coordinate to slew to. And then it also is courtesy of Skywatcher getting us this close to the mount 
I mean, this close to the exact coordinate and then allowing us to plate solve here in sharp cap. Uh, what we're doing right now is beginning to tune these mids. And you notice we can see different things based on what we want to observe. If we want to observe right here in the brighter part of the nebula, we can dial down the brightness. And that lets us see, by the way, in the Orion Nebula, all of these are named. All these different parts are named. We can tune back. And let's zoom in on that just so you can see this. So see what we've done now is we've, we've dialed back. So there, there's what's going to be the running man out here. Can't even see the running man now. But you've got uh, M42, and then this has a different M number here. What is it? M, I forget. We'll look it up in a second. I think it's M40. Is it M42 and M43? Is that what those are? Uh, but, but that's what this uh, middle slider allows us to do. We can actually control exactly what we want to look at. And this lets us see inside this very hot uh, star-forming region the brightest part of the Orion Nebula, that it's where all the fireworks are going off. This is, this is where the explosions are happening. And by dialing back this mid, we can actually zoom in on that using our, our uh, ZWO ASI 2600. And now we're able to look at this region. And we can see the, the, this red part is the hydrogen alpha part of the actual uh, explosive star forming area. All these gases are being collected. Uh, they're, they're radiating because of these bright stars that are emanating through them. You've got emission nebula going on here as well as just the regular glow. And then the other thing we can do is broaden back out. See, now look, that, that's all we were looking at right there. And then using this middle slider, we can now uh, tune in, so to speak. We can tune in using our mids. And what we're doing is we're, we're basically changing the definition of the light frequencies that we're uh, recording and, and displaying here. Displaying would be a better word. We're, we're changing the wavelengths, I guess, would be a better way to say it. We're changing the wavelengths that we're displaying. And what we're doing now is we're seeing more of the wavelengths that are, that are closer here toward the left side of this histogram, which lets us now see just how big the Orion Nebula is. Now for, for and, and, that, and that's dust. I mean, that is literally dust. That, I want to tell you, this is not vignetting. That is real live dust in this case. My, my camera has no vignetting going on at all. Look at these stars we're picking up out here at the edges. This is the dust that emanates from the Orion Nebula. And by skating around here, we can see all that dust as a big glowing nebula. And that's probably a great part of the sky to finish on. Uh, let's do one more thing to finish out. Let's listen to the description of uh, the Orion Nebula. Um, and we'll go to that, by the way. And... Slewing, slewing complete. Oh, rats. Did that, I just hit go to, so it, I, what I had meant to hit was center. That changed our alignment. So I'm going to stop live stacking for a second uh, because that'll change that alignment. But what I wanted to do is go to this info and play this tour. M42 is the great nebula in Orion, one of the most spectacular sights in the sky and without doubt the best of the nebula. It is within the Sword of Orion, due south of the famous three stars that make a belt. The nebula can be glimpsed as an odd square-edged star with the unaided eye, 
But to even the smallest telescope, M42 is a swirling world of gas with twists and turns, like spilled fluid caught mid-splash and frozen. The nebula has impressed many as seeming to be in motion and looks like something almost alive. The American astronomer Bernard said M42 looked like a dusty bat flying into the field of the great one-meter refractor at Yerkes. Binoculars show M42 to be a fan-shaped cloud associated with a few faint stars. Only slightly larger telescopes show the structure of the nebula and the famous trapezium. This is a set of at least four stars tightly associated like dancers in the middle of a floor, uncertain which of the available partners to take in arm. Photos of M42 are common, but usually the center is burned out, and the interior details, which the eye picks out readily, are not recorded. None can appreciate the Orion Nebula from the evidence of pictures alone. It must be seen at the eyepiece. M42 is a cloud about 1,500 light-years away. Although its gas is rarefied and like a vacuum by earthly standards, so large is M42 that its mass is 10,000 times that of the Sun. Recently, large telescopes have found stars in the making within the swirls and loops of this most lovely object. Okay, so I think I probably messed up our stack when I hit go to because it it probably recentered on what the because the planetarium software can also issue go to commands and I hit go to instead of center. Sorry about that. So see it said, oh look, SharpCap is smart enough it's not stacking them. Uh, yeah, it's showing the previous live stack and that's because it picked up that we changed. I'm pretty sure. So it's ignoring. See, now it's live stacking again, but it knows that we moved the telescope. So it's ignoring those other frames. Good for it. Well, this is a good place to end. It is uh, the end of our time, but I just want to thank you guys for being a part of this. Uh, I want to tell you it is a joy for me to learn this along with you. And I've been very honest with the folks at Cloudy Nights, uh, you know, the forum. I've been very honest about the fact that I am on a journey. Um, this is probably my ninth or tenth time out with the scope, and uh, as you can tell, I'm still learning. But I love it that you guys come here and observe me. You you uh, encourage me, and you help out. Here's Tommy saying, "Looks great. Look at you encourage." Robert, thank you, Doug, for sharing. Good night, everyone. Going back to bed. Oh yeah, because it's very late for you over there in UK. Uh, thanks so much for getting up in the middle of the night, Robert. Uh, I want to thank you guys for being a part of this and uh, wish you well. We're going to end the live stream, but I will tell you this. If throughout the rest of the night while I'm observing here, if I pick up anything else that looks fun, I'll make a what we're calling now a skylet of it. And a skylet is just a short little four-minute or five-minute uh, close-up of that item at the... Uh, uh, YouTube channel for Emerald Hill Skies. And then what I'll do tomorrow is I'll send you, if you're subscribed, to the Emerald Hill Skies uh, email list, which you set up at emeraldhillskies.com. That's where you subscribe to that, emeraldhillskies.com. If you sign up to that email list, I'll send you a kind of reminder about those skylets. But then the other thing you can do is you can just subscribe to the YouTube channel, Emerald Hill Skies. And that lets you, if you click that bell as well as subscribe, then if you're logged into YouTube, it lets you be notified when, you, when, when we do a new video. It lets you hear about it first. And I mean literally you hear about it within, within 10 seconds of posting the video, you hear about it. So I'd like to encourage you, if you like this sort of thing, uh, continue on by uh, going to YouTube and finding the channel Emerald Hill Skies and clicking subscribe and then click the bell. Go to emeraldhillskies.com, sign up for the email list, and listen, thank you so much for being a part of this tonight. And God bless you and your sky.